this farm and the buildings on it are part of a revolution. A revolution which has reached to the deepest roots of agriculture. A revolution which has begun but has not yet ended. This is also part of the revolution. And this This too, the way the farm family lives. This is part of the revolution as well. And finally this, the link between the farmer and other citizens. This has also played a major role in the revolution on the land. revolution? How did it begin? How has it progressed? What does it mean, not only to the farmer, but to all of us? Up to the beginning of this century, every farm was a bastion, a fortress of individualism. was known as a completely integrated operation. He grew his own grain. He mixed his own livestock feed. He raised and processed his own food. he ate his own produce. The only crops he sent to market were those left over after he had fed himself and his family. Farmer was largely self-sufficient, but this self-sufficiency could not continue. Giant cities grew up, peopled by industrial workers clamoring for food. The farmer had to produce that food, not only for himself, but for hundreds and thousands of other people. He became a businessman, negotiating prices for his wares, and in that moment, his self-sufficiency ended. He was projected into the world of commerce, sometimes triumphing over it, more often at its mercy. This meant he had to grow more on his land and find labor to help him do it. Hired labor was becoming scarce, so more and more the farmer turned to machines. The new machinery is both complex and efficient. In some cases, a single piece of machinery can do the work of a dozen men. is pleased with the way it works for him. He admires a display of farm machinery the way a city man delights in visiting a new car showroom. There is one trouble. The new machinery doesn't come cheap. The 
farmer can produce more food, much more, but it costs him more to do it. And at the same time, the price he has paid for his produce is not keeping up with the cost. Some farmers can't afford the new machinery. They go on for a while in the same old way, sowing and harvesting by hand or with insufficient equipment, always haunted by the specter of rising costs and falling prices. Some are not able to survive the cost-price squeeze. Many are forced to give up farming and auction off their property and belongings. Some of these were inefficient, bad farm managers. Some worked hard, but simply didn't have the means to improve their farms, to make them produce the necessary amount. The exodus from farms has become a widespread movement. Those who stay on the farms have to work hard to keep in the race. They are now businessmen in earnest. The account book is as important as the cultivator. They need more and more money for supplies, for operating costs, for improvements, for replacing machinery which has a way of wearing out. They also need money to buy conveniences. Modern farm families are no longer willing to deny themselves the commodities enjoyed by city dwellers. They feel they have a right to them, and so they have. But just as in the city, such things cost money. And the only way to make money is to operate an increasingly efficient farm. Some farmers achieve efficiency by mechanizing whatever operations they can, by making better use of space and acreage. Others have given up mixed farming and concentrated on a specialty, such as large-scale production of broiling chickens. But if mechanization and specialization are a way to make money, they also cost money, more money all the time. George Hunt, a specialist in farm management, gives his view of the farmer's problem. The small mixed farmer is finding himself in a very difficult position today because he is forced to compete not against other farmers like himself, but against the large operator who is operating on a large, volume, efficient basis. The best known example, the one that we're most familiar with, is the broader business, where we find one man looking up after up to 40, 50,000 broilers, producing in one year maybe uh, up, upwards of a quarter of a million birds by one man. This, uh, this puts the average small mixed farmer in the position where he either has to get larger to compete on this volume basis, or he must face the facts that he's going to be out of business. It's that serious. We think that the, the farmer is at a crossroads today, and he must make the decision of whether he's going to quit farming or whether he's going to find the capital and the ability to get bigger. This is the position the average farmer has found himself in during recent years. He has had to expand or go under. And since credit for expansion is often not available for farmers at the bank, many farmers have to seek a different source. And now, again, the term integration becomes important but not the simple integration of the farmer who fed, slaughtered, and ate his livestock. This time, integration is far-reaching, complex, involving packing houses, feed companies, chick hatcheries. And the mass production of weanling pigs. To obtain the money he needs for expansion, 
the farmer enters into contracts with meat processors, with feed companies, with hatcheries, with retail stores, sometimes with combinations of all these. The contracts vary widely, but they all have certain common elements. They all take a number of separate operations, draw them together, connect them, integrate them. Here's the way they work. A farmer may contract with a feed company. The company supplies them with feed for, say, chickens, sometimes with credit to put up the buildings to house them. For this service, the farmer pays interest and is free to obtain his chicks where he pleases and to market the grown birds where he can. Sometimes the feed company may draw a hatchery into the agreement. Together, they contract to supply the farmer with chicks plus feed. The farmer grows the birds under supervision of the companies and receives either a flat rate or a share of the profits. On occasion, the feed companies and hatcheries will contract with packing houses. When all of these operations are under one company, it's called vertical integration. The farmer provides the buildings and his labor. He grows the birds from the company's hatchery, feeds them on feed provided by the company, and presents them for marketing by the company. In return, he enjoys the security of receiving a certain minimum income. One of the Canadian pioneers in integration is Toronto Elevators. Harold Cook, manager of the feed division, explains something about their operation. Uh, we have hundreds of farmers with contracts. And uh, like everything else, uh, some are very successful and some are less successful. That depends upon the individual farmer himself. Uh, all have an equal opportunity. All are financed on the uh, same uh, basis. And surprisingly enough, we have farmers who are very well off, who come to us for contracts. And uh, we've been told quite frankly by some of them that uh, it's this bookkeeping angle that interests them. They know exactly what they make out of a lot of hogs or out of a, a certain flock of broilers or a, certain flock of turkeys. Um, others, and the majority, come to us because they just haven't money enough to do this operation themselves. Uh, but we ourselves, when there is a profit to be made, that is the farmer's profit. And we like him to be in there. That, that gives him his independence. That gives him his incentive to go out and do a job for himself and for his family. But the only way we can get our money back is through volume. And, of course, uh, that's one reason why we are in this contract business, because we help the farmer, and in turn, we get volume which helps us. Skyline Farms outside of Toronto produces one-fifth of the broiling chickens consumed in Ontario. The general manager, Ray Marshall, feels that integration has aided both the farmer and the processor. Uh, what it does, uh, uh, contract farming, uh, is give continuity of supply. Now, continuity of supply is the, is the, uh, the key to possibly uh, large business. If you haven't got continuity supply, you have a terrific fluctuation in prices, you have times of supply and times when you have uh, nothing to offer whatsoever. And it's impossible to build a sound industry and a large industry of any kind on that type of an operation. So I would say that contract farming has uh, or has been the key to building this industry up to its large volume that we have today. The practice of giving farmers contracts to grow livestock has mushroomed. Integration 
vertical or otherwise, has had far-reaching effects on the meat industry. 90% of all the broilers and an estimated third of all the hogs marketed in Canada have been grown under some form of integration scheme. The increase in growing efficiency, the steady supply of birds have combined to give the housewife poultry at very reasonable prices. In order to accomplish this, farmers have to mass produce the birds or animals they grow. This is a mass production hog factory described by its owner, Clarence Funger. This is what you call a hog parlor. It's uh, comprised of a building approximately about 100 feet long. It's uh, divided into separate pens of a run approximately 65 to 75 in a pen. That's, uh, as you see, these pipes going through, goes through to the feeders. Uh, grain is brought through these right off the truck and into those bins. Eliminates all the hard manual slugging of it. Also, you'll see the pigs standing around over there. Automatic water is under pressure all the time. And this particular pen's line here is gates that swing and keep your pigs back in. And the manure is all taken right through with a tractor right out through onto a spreader. No pitch of manure, which is a great help to a lazy man. I admit that. Contract farming has meant an end to uncertainty for Ovilla Myers. I've been in the pig business for about two years on my own with the uh, contract feeding. If a guy has maybe a hundred pigs, well, I don't know whether it'd be worthwhile getting out and doing chores, but I'd run around 360, and it's worth coming out and doing chores. I was, wasn't here too long, and, and I needed every nickel I had, and I couldn't get into pigs this way, and they offered to put me in that way, and I find it pretty good, and I'm making money, and they're making money, so everybody's happy. And then if something happened, take me, I, well, I haven't got too much money, and if something happened that uh, pigs dropped so low I couldn't make any money, I can't lose this way. I get half the profit if there's any profit. If there's no profit, I don't get it. But I still get $2.50 for every hog. But other farmers, like James Haggerty, are disturbed by the trend to integration. I feel that uh, if I should uh, begin to contract that... Uh, I'm endangering my, my position as a, as a farm operator if I begin to take uh, someone in as a partner in my business. Uh, partnership certainly means sharing of some kind or other, and I find the margin is plenty small enough for one, for one in this business. I can't see that uh, taking in a partner certainly must increase the cost. There's a saying among the farmers in this area, I suppose in all areas, that uh, whoever owns the livestock will eventually own the land. I think it's the, uh, the most important factor that we've got to consider in this, that you cannot, in a livestock operation, have one man owning the uh, livestock and the other owning the land. It will uh, eventually all go to the owner of the livestock. I look to see uh, whole communities uh, become... Uh, Sharecroppers, possibly not much better than the cotton sharecropper was in the South. Individual farmers are not the only ones who worry about integration. The cooperatives, long advocates of farmer independence, have reservations about the development. The general manager of the United Cooperatives of Ontario, Hugh Bailey, voices some of the thoughts which have disturbed him and his board of directors. A lot of the people, the, the feed companies, who have contracts don't lend the money to the farmer. They just make a hired man out of them. They just give them so much a, a month or so much a pig. And they own the feed and the pig and everything. Now that's the big, the trend today. Because when it got to be just a credit business, there was so many technical difficulties uh, that if, they, if the feed company just says, here's 10 pigs or 100 pigs, I've bought them for you. I'll send the feed in here, and I'll send a, a specialist around to see with their medication. I'll see that they're, it's well done. I'll give you two dollars and a half a pig, or three dollars a pig, for to put them ready to the market for me. Then the farmer is really just a hired man. In Ottawa, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture representing many of the farmers of Canada, has spent a great deal of time investigating the possible long-range effects of integration on farmers. 
H. H. Hannum, president of the Federation, sums up some of the results of this study. It's easy to see how many farmers would be interested in vertical integration because it could solve particularly an acute financial or credit problem. That is, many young farmers, uh, many well-informed farmers, and ambitious farmers uh, have no credit and, and, and very little capital. Now, this opportunity to get capital through uh, an integrated project and then to get an extended line of credit should appeal to them because uh, from a small operation, they could in a very short time expand into a very large operation. Uh, that's, that really appeals to, to many farmers. Uh, perhaps the, the most attractive feature of vertical integration to an average farmer is the fact that if he ties up with this man on a contract, he's got an assured market for the output of his farm for the duration of the contract and then a chance to renew. But it may also mean that he has also the chance to expand his output gradually or from year to year and gradually move up and have that market. Now, all of this put together, then, may mean to him a very much increased income than he had before. Now, that's, uh, that's a big attraction to, to many farmers, and to many farmers who are in the position before where it wasn't going to be possible uh, under the way they had been operating. Certainly, there are disadvantages uh, for a farmer in vertical integration. For example, uh, he has a contract, but at the end of the contract year, suppose the integrator decides not to sign him up again. He's had an assured market there for a term, but where does he go then? Markets are not available for all that farmers are putting on the, on the market these days. Secondly, uh, being tied up on a contract, it, of course it depends on the nature of the contract, but that contract could mean that he isn't a free agent any longer, uh, in the buying of his own supplies. Supposing he's tied up uh, on a feed contract or with a feed firm, he's not free to go to some other. Uh, those disadvantages I've been speaking of are disadvantages uh, for the individual farmer. But the disadvantages could be dangers for agriculture as a whole. Uh, I'm thinking of the, of, of the fact that control of marketing could pass out of the hands of producers themselves. It could pass into the hands of non-farmers, of private uh, traders, of corporations. Yes, and of giant corporations. And if it does, then it means a new type of enslavement for agriculture. Some cooperative groups propose to enter the integration field on the farmer's behalf. Mr. Bailey explains. Uh, we have now got four different types of contracts that we're offering different farmers, depending on their needs. That is, uh, we've it all the way from just providing a little credit to a hired man status. We've got the four. And uh, we're having some acceptance of all three different types. Whatever the result of it is, regardless of whether it's big or little, the the results. If we're able to build our feed business bigger than bigger by, by virtue of the fact that this program is here, we will distribute back to put the producers of Ontario the result. Now, it could be a loss we'll distribute, or it could be a profit. But that's, in my opinion, if, if integration is here, I would sooner see the producer do the integrating from the floor, from the farm to the packing plant then I would have the packing plant integrate down to the farmer and own the farm. I think the farmer has just as much right to own the feed company as the feed company has to own him. And I've, that's a, a personal conviction with me. And I have no apologies for that. And that's not decrying the feed companies either. But if we're going to have integration, for Pete's sake, let the farmers get their hand in it through their co-op, which does return the result. And that result won't be any better than the, than the result of another company, mind you. But if it's comparable, if we're able to do as good a job as the other companies, there should be a result somewhere in the integration. The 
revolution is still continuing on the land. Integration is part of this revolution. Whether one feels it could have or should have been avoided, it has arrived and has firmly entrenched itself in the poultry industry and in the hog industry. Perhaps it will spread to other segments of farm production, to beef, to dairy products, to eggs, perhaps not. Because there has been a revolution on the land, and because integration has played a definite part in the revolution, the family farm as we once knew it will never again be quite the same.